Protestant Reformation stands as the most far-reaching, world-changing display of God's grace since the first century and the birth of the church. Steve Lawson explains that it was not a single act, nor was it led by one man, but this history-altering movement played out on different stages over many decades, but its cumulative impact was enormous. Church historian Philip Schaff writes, the Reformation of the 16th century is, next to the introduction of Christianity, the greatest event in history. The Reformation was a seismic eruption of spiritual revival that shook Roman Catholic corruption to its core. It resulted in the recovery of the biblical gospel, which had been lost for centuries. John MacArthur says it's about when truth was unshackled from a millennium of virtual bondage in a blasphemous prison built by the apostate hands of men. Let's begin this morning by looking at the setting. Most church historians point to the nailing of the 95 Theses by Martin Luther to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg as the official beginning of the Reformation. And that, of course, took place on October 31st, 1517, and we commemorate the 500th anniversary of that this week. But there was so much that took place before this event that really set the stage for this momentous occasion. The Middle Ages had brought a flood of corruption and false teaching into the church. And of course, the church at this point in history was primarily the Roman Catholic Church. By the 16th century, the office of the Pope had become such a position of authority that the Popes were essentially deified. False teaching concerning the elements of the Lord's Supper had been perverted into the belief that they actually became the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. And this gave the priest who administered it nearly absolute power over the souls of the people. And to summarize the situation, the Roman Catholic Church had risen to a position of near absolute power, and along with that power came widespread corruption. There were a few dissident groups along the way, like the Waldensians, who tried to stand against Rome, but they were essentially crushed. There were a few early embers that came along before the raging inferno of the Reformation. One of those men was John Wycliffe, 150 years before Martin Luther. He was a brilliant scholar and a student of Scripture. In fact, he entered Oxford University at the age of 16 and ultimately became their most prominent theologian. In light of his study of Scripture, he began to teach against some of the false teaching of the Catholic Church. And perhaps the primary one was the doctrine of transubstantiation, which at this time was a fairly new doctrine in the Catholic Church. This eventually led to his being forced out at Oxford, but he went to Lutterworth, where he undertook the greatest work of his life, the translation of the Bible into the common English of the day. And by the way, the Reformation cannot really be attributed to any one man. The Reformation was ultimately the result of the unleashing of the Word of God in the common language of the people of that day. This included not only the translation of the Bible into the common languages of Europe, but also, in certain cases, the faithful preaching 
of the Word of God. And along with the translation of the Bible into various languages at this time, the invention of the printing press allowed it to be widely circulated. Previous to this time, it had been limited to Latin, which was a language that common people could not read, and the priests were the only ones who had copies of the Scripture. Supposedly, this was to protect the Bible from misinterpretation and misapplication, but the effect had been that it had kept the people in the dark concerning what the Word of God actually said. The priests were not really teaching it faithfully, and so the people were kept in the dark until the light of the Scripture began to shine forth. Well, John Wycliffe was persecuted, but he did not die as a martyr. He actually died during a worship service on New Year's Eve in 1384. However, he was so hated by the Roman church that they later burned his bones. And one historian wrote, they burnt his bones to ashes and cast them into the swift, a neighboring brook running hard by. Thus, the brook conveyed his ashes into the Avon, the Avon into the Severn, the Severn into the narrow seas, and they into the main sea. And so the ashes of Wycliffe are symbolic of his doctrine, which is now spread throughout the world. Another early ember was a man named John Haas. He became the rector and preacher at the Church of the Holy Infants of Bethlehem in Prague. He was heavily influenced by the teachings of John Wycliffe. And that led him to a longing to see the church reformed. Prague was a good place for him because it had become the center of Reformation thinking. And in 1391, a wealthy merchant had built the chapel there as a center for reformed preaching. And so John Haas faithfully preached the word of God from this chapel. But because of this, the Catholic Church had placed Prague under an interdict, meaning they could have no religious ceremonies there at all. This meant no weddings, no funerals, no sacraments, nothing. The problem was that the people concluded that this essentially condemned them to hell, and so they demanded that Haas leave so they could get the interdict removed. And to make a long story short, Haas eventually stood before the Council of Constance in 1414 to give an answer for his teaching. He had been promised protection from the Emperor Sigmund, but the council declared that there is no such thing as security for a heretic, and so they condemned Haas to die. The name Haas means goose, and that was a common nickname for him. So when you say his goose was cooked, you're really referring to John Haas, whether you know it or not, because they burned him at the stake. Haas died singing, Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy on me. And as you may know, Luther was later referred to as a Hussite because he agreed with many of John Haas's teachings. In fact, a 16th century Bohemian Psalter painted Wycliffe as striking the spark. John Haas is kindling it into a coal and Martin Luther is blowing it into a great flame. So as Steve Lawson writes, under the guiding hand of God, the world scene had been uniquely prepared for the Reformation. The church was greatly in need of reform. 
Spiritual darkness personified the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible was a closed book. Spiritual ignorance ruled the minds of the people. The gospel was perverted. Church traditions covered both pope and priest, and the corruption of ungodliness contaminated both dogma and practice. One of the greatest forms of corruption at this point, as you know, was the sale of indulgences. And the unbiblical concept of purgatory had become deeply entrenched in Catholic theology. And so the sale of indulgences became a great form of fundraising in the church. St. Peter's Basilica in Rome had gotten to such a bad condition that it had been condemned and it needed to be replaced. And so Pope Julius II began construction, but he died before he could finish it. He was followed by Pope Leo, who worked out a deal with Albert of Brandenburg to pay for it. But Albert's way of securing the funds involved the sale of indulgences. And the idea was that if you bought an indulgence, you could shorten your time in purgatory or you could help a loved one get out of purgatory. And indulgences were also seen as a work that could convey grace and pay for a sin that might condemn someone to hell. And some people even began to see the indulgences as a ticket to heaven. You could just buy your way to heaven. In other words, the Catholic Church used the fear of hell and the fear of purgatory to get the people to pay for St. Peter's Basilica. And if you've ever been to that place, you know what an expensive undertaking that must have been. Well, Albert went out and hired a man named Johann Tetzel, a Dominican friar, as his primary seller of indulgences. And Tetzel would parade into town after town with a cross bearing the papal arms and the Pope's bull or official declaration was carried on a golden embroidered cushion. And he would then start his pitch filled with emotional appeals about loved ones who were suffering in purgatory and then would follow the jingle in the German language As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. It was primarily this abuse and corruption that prompted Martin Luther to nail 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg church. And that was like a bulletin board in those days. He called on a discussion to ensue on the issue. And yet, this turned out to be the match that lit the early embers into a roaring flame that we now call the Reformation. Luther was angered by this abuse and corruption and even one time quipped, if the Pope has the authority to shorten someone's time in purgatory, why doesn't he do it for free? And I don't want to make this entire sermon about church history, but Luther was the first of the magisterial reformers. And he was then followed by other great men like John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, William Tyndale, John Knox, and others. To a man, they were firmly committed to the authority of Scripture, the biblical gospel of grace, and the sovereignty of God. They were men who protested the false teaching of the Catholic Church. And in fact, the term Protestant was originally coined as a derogatory term by the Catholics to describe someone who protested against the Catholic Church's teachings. But it is important that we understand that the Reformation was much bigger 
than just Martin Luther and Lutheranism. It was a rediscovery of the biblical gospel, and it spawned a number of groups and denominations under the banner of Protestantism. But I want to move now to what the Reformation was all about. Theologically, the Reformation became known for five statements of distinction from Roman Catholic theology. And so we move now, secondly, to the solas, the solas. Over time, the message of the Reformation became encapsulated into five slogans known as the five solas of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Solus Christus, Christ alone. Sola Gratia, grace alone. Sola Fide, faith alone. And Soli Deo Gloria, the glory of God alone. And the key word in all of those is the common word sola. In fact, it is this word that distinguishes between Catholic and Protestant theology. And it is this one word for which the Reformation martyrs died. R.C. Sproul has said, it is no exaggeration to say that the eye of the Reformation tornado was this one little word. The idea of the word sola is that it is solely this and not and or in addition to. The Catholic understanding of authority includes Scripture, but it also includes church traditions, church councils, and the edict of the Pope. The Reformers said soul, the sole authority in the church is the Word of God. The Catholic system of salvation includes grace, faith, and Christ but it also includes human works, the sacraments, and staying in good graces with the church. The reformers declared salvation is by God's grace alone through saving faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. So the word alone is the watershed word. And really, the first of these, Sola Scriptura, was the divine, defining benchmark of the entire Reformation because all the other solas flowed from Sola Scriptura. The Reformers were students of the Word of God. John Calvin was a pure expositor of the Word of God. He preached verse by verse through the New Testament. But they all based their theology on the study of the Bible alone. This is known as the material principle of the Reformation because it is the very core of biblical Christianity. The Bible and only the Bible is the basis of our faith. James Montgomery Boyce states this core belief when he writes, the Bible alone is our ultimate authority, not the Pope, not the church, not the traditions of the church or church councils, still less personal intimations or subjective, subjective feelings, but Scripture alone. The Reformation was essentially over which authority should have primacy. Philip Schaff writes, while the humanists went back to the ancient classics and revived the spirit of Greek and Roman paganism, the reformers went back to the sacred scriptures in the original languages and revived the spirit of apostolic Christianity. They were fired by an enthusiasm for the gospel, such as had never been known since the days of the apostle Paul. Christ rose from the tomb of human tradition, so to speak, and was preached again with his power, words of life and power. The Bible, heretofore a book for priests only, was now translated anew and better 
than ever into the vernacular tongues of Europe and made a book of the people. And every Christian man could henceforth go to the fountainhead of inspiration and sit at the feet of the divine teacher without priestly permission and intervention. Of course, we're all familiar with the great reformers, but it is important to recognize that the ultimate credit for the Reformation does not belong to any of these men. The ultimate reason for the Reformation was the power of God's Word. The Reformation was not brought about by cleverness or creativity. It was not brought about through human charisma or personality. It was not the result of any kind of church growth strategy, ingenious marketing schemes, or seeker-driven fads. It was brought about by the unleashing of the Holy Scriptures. And when Martin Luther was summoned to appear before the Roman emperor to defend what he had taught and written, here's what he said. The works are mine, but unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. The reformers were firmly committed to sola scriptura, the word of God alone. But they were also committed to a biblical understanding of the gospel that had been lost for hundreds of years. And we really need to take sola fide and sola gratia together because they are an inseparable combination. But I want to start with sola fide. This is the heart of the Reformation doctrine of justification, the doctrine of salvation. Martin Luther claimed that this was the article upon which the church stands or falls. It is the understanding that man is justified by God, not on the basis of works, but by faith alone. The salvation of God can only be procured by saving faith. And of course, this precious doctrine was clarified by Martin Luther. At one point, Luther even admitted he hated God because he knew God would judge him for his sin. But as he studied the epistle to the Romans, he could not get past Romans 1.17. The first half of that verse says, for in it, the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That one simple truth radically changed his life and ultimately ignited the Protestant Reformation. It was the sudden realization illuminated to his mind and heart by the Holy Spirit that God's righteousness could become the possession of the sinner. And that must happen by faith alone. That became the rediscovery of the biblical gospel that had long been lost. I mean, if you go back to that verse, it reads in its entirety, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Luther had always seen the righteousness of God as an attribute of the sovereign Lord whereby he judged sinners, not as something a sinner could possess. And this was a radical discovery that put an end to the theological dark ages. In his own words, Luther stated, I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by faith. Then I grasp that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God 
justifies the sinner through faith alone. Thereupon, he said, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. He said, the whole of scripture took on new meaning. And whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. And then he said this, this passage of Paul became to me a gate to heaven. In fact, once Luther understood this doctrine of sola fide, it became offensive to him that anyone would teach that we can contribute to our own salvation in any way. In Luther's mind, that teaching implied that Jesus' perfect sacrifice on the cross was not enough to pay for our sins. Now it was offensive to him that we would have the notion that we could somehow add to the atoning work of Christ by our own good works. John MacArthur writes, justification by faith alone was the great truth that dawned on Luther and dramatically altered the church And because Christians are justified by faith alone, their standing before God is not in any way related to personal merits. God receives us, receives as righteous those who believe, not because of any good thing that he sees in them, but solely on the basis of Christ's righteousness, which is reckoned to their accounts. That's exactly what Romans 4, 5 says. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. This, of course, is the great Reformation doctrine of imputation. And the concept is borrowed from the banking world, and you know what that means. This is the great spiritual transaction in which Christ takes our debt and we get his credit. He takes our sin, we get his righteousness. Or another way to say it is, he paid what we owed and could never pay. And he gave us what he has, which we could never earn. And this is all accomplished by faith alone. This doctrine of imputation is clearly espoused in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He got our sin. We got his righteousness. And that is all accomplished through faith alone. In fact, if we go back to Romans 4 and look at verses 4 and 5, it says this, Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. How would you like it if your boss gave you your next paycheck and said to you, here's your gift. I mean, you probably would say, wait, wait just a minute. I worked really hard for that paycheck. I earned that paycheck. But that's what Paul's saying here. And then he contrasts this with the salvation of God, which is never earned and never deserved. It is always received totally by God's grace through faith. And the one who receives the salvation of God is the one who does not work, but believes. And he is the one who is justified. So this is the doctrine of sola fide by faith alone. Romans 3.22 says the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Romans 3.28 says a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. 
Romans 5.1 says we are justified through faith. Romans, I mean, Acts 16.31 says believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It is all by saving faith. Well, closely associated with sola fide is sola gratia. This is the understanding that the salvation of God is totally an act of his grace, not based on any merit on the part of man. We humans do not contribute to our own salvation as much as we would like to think we do. Salvation is a free gift from God, and our only part is to receive that free gift through faith. The Reformers also rejected the idea that grace has to be added to. And as you probably know, the Catholic Church teaches that the grace of God begins the process of salvation, but they believe that we then have to add good works to that. The Reformers flatly rejected that teaching. And the belief of the Reformers, which is still our belief today, is that salvation is totally by grace through faith. It is not the results, uh, result of any human works. And the grace of God cannot be enhanced through the keeping of what the Catholics call the sacraments. And they call them that because they believe that they have the power to convey grace, but there's nothing in Scripture that teaches that. In fact, there are only two biblical ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and we intentionally do not call them sacraments because we do not believe they convey grace in any way. Certainly, we would say that the salvation of God cannot be purchased by indulgences, as was being taught in Luther's day, or through the blessings of the priests or through any other religious practice. The salvation of God is completely by God's grace alone. God's grace is absolutely sufficient. There is nothing that needs to be added to it. In fact, nothing can be added to it or it nullifies it. If you add something to grace, it is no longer grace. And of course, the primary verse on sola gratia is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Then you have sola, solus Christus, Christ alone. The object of true saving faith must be Jesus Christ alone. He is the one and only Savior. Now, this really should be a slam dunk for anyone who knows the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is uh, one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. John 14.6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ alone. And yet, amazingly, there are many today who say that they are Christians, but do not see Jesus Christ as essential for salvation. According to University of Virginia sociologist James Hunter, 35% of evangelical seminarians deny that faith in Christ is absolutely necessary. According to researcher George Barna, the exact same percentage of evangelical Protestants in America agree with the statement, quote, God will save all good people when they die, regardless of whether they've trusted in Christ, end quote. Over one quarter of professed born-again evangelicals surveyed agreed with this statement. If a person is good 
or does good enough uh, does enough good things for others during his life they will earn a place in heaven folks that's a problem and this is one of the main reasons why the reformation still matters today we have lost the ground the reformers gained people are just as confused about the true biblical gospel today as ever before. But the New Testament is very clear. And we've seen it in our study of Hebrews. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. The Bible does not teach that Jesus is one good way among others. It does not even teach that he is the best way. It teaches he is the only way. And then finally, we come to soli deo gloria, glory to God alone. This is connected with the other solas because if our salvation is totally of God, then we can never take any credit for it. You see, those who believe that their own good works aid in their salvation might think they deserve to share in the glory. But a genuine believer understands all the glory goes to God alone. Now, in addition to the five solas, there were also a few secondary doctrines that the reformers taught as well. I won't spend any time on them today, but they were such doctrines as the priesthood of all believers and the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. And we've seen the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints in our study of Hebrews. On that doctrine, I do want to read just one quote from Erwin Lutzer in his book, uh, Rescuing the Gospel. Lutzer wrote, the basic teaching of the Catholic Church was that each sacrament dispensed grace. However, no one sacrament dispensed enough grace to save a sinner. Assurance of salvation was beyond reach because no one could be assured that they had enough grace to gain admittance to heaven. Of course, the reformers taught that God's grace in salvation is totally sufficient and that we can have absolute confidence and assurance of our salvation. But in closing this morning, I want to just move to the last point, which is the significance. The significance. Why is the Reformation still important today? Why should we care what happened in Europe 500 years ago? Are you aware that a recent poll revealed that over half of all American Protestants today don't even know that Martin Luther's writings and actions inspired the Reformation? Many have forgotten this important history, and therefore, for many today, the Reformation is no longer important. But that is a tragic reality. The truth of the matter is that even though Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to a church door in Wittenberg, 500 years ago, the reverberations of the Reformation are still being felt today. These truths matter infinitely. In fact, the Reformers had another Latin slogan. It was Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. The church is always reforming and must continually be reformed. A recent article appeared in our denominational paper recently uh, entitled, Is Reformation Theology Waning Among Protestants? And the answer is yes. The opening statement reads like this. 500 years after the start of the Protestant Reformation, a majority of U.S. Protestants reject the Reformation doctrines of sola fide and Sola Scriptura. A study by the Pew Research Center found that less than half of U.S. Protestants hold 
the Reformation doctrine that faith alone is needed to attain salvation. More than half espouse the historically Catholic doctrine that good deeds and faith are required to get into heaven. Concerning the doctrine of sola scriptura, just 46% of U.S. Protestants believe that the Bible provides all religious guidance Christians need. More than half say that believers need guidance from the church teachings and traditions as well. This tells us we still need to be teaching these Reformation doctrines. We have lost ground in the last 500 years. And the vast majority of churches today are no longer teaching these vital doctrines, much less the history and the significance of the Reformation. Folks, this is critical to the truth of God. And we are in danger of losing the true biblical faith once again. John MacArthur writes, the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith is and always has been the number one target of the enemy's attack. It provides the foundation that bridge, uh, of the bridge that reconciles God and man. And without that key doctrine, Christianity falls. But the doctrine of the reformers that they so painstakingly clarified, even spilled their blood over, have become so, it has become so muddled today that many Protestants barely recognize it. In fact, recently there were some who were standing against a clear presentation of the doctrine of justification and calling it useless hair splitting. Really? The very doctrine the reformers gave their lives for is useless hair splitting? No. It is the biblical gospel and the only way anyone can be saved. And we need to be reminded once again that no true revival, no true reformation will ever come in the church through gimmicks or fads. It will not come through creativity or human methodologies. It will only come through the unleashing of God's truth. It will only come through the faithful proclamation of the truths of Scripture. The lessons of the Reformation are still very relevant to us today. But let me warn you, it is becoming more and more difficult every single day for us to stand with Luther and proclaim, Here I stand, I can do no other. God, help us to stand. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning that you would help us, please help us, to understand the significance of this event in history and what it means to us, how we understand the gospel, the essence of genuine saving faith, the very bedrock of our hope in Christ. And Lord, we pray this morning if there's any person here today that does not know Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior, has never put his faith and trust in Christ alone, believing solely in the grace of God and salvation, that he will come and trust you today and receive that free gift of God. And Lord, we pray that all of us as believers would stand firm on these truths, that we would not waver, even if it costs us, that we would be firmly committed to these truths because they are biblical truths. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we went just a little bit over. I hope you don't mind.